So we just covered extrinsic and intrinsic asthma. There's also exercise, indu uh, exercise induced asthma and occupational asthma. So exercise induced is common in children and adolescents. Um, again, the bronchospasms are triggered by exercise, but they'll usually resolve in about 60 minutes. We do worry about water loss across the respiratory epithelium. It's not just the lack of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. There's also dehydration. Uh, even me talking for five hours a day, I'm at risk for dehydration. We do lose a lot of fluid across the respiratory epithelium. But you always see me drinking water all of the time. Uh, occupational asthma means that we're going to have, a, it's usually going to be a blue collar worker, not exclusively. They're going to be sensitized to be to something that, a material that they're working with every day. And I've got sort of a, a construction guy here. It could also be, let's say, a cleaner and exposure to a daily cleaning product could also be something that would cause occupational asthma. Uh, sensitization is going to be ineffective. The issue here is that person in that job, in all likelihood, is going to need to keep working in that job. They may or may not have skills that allow them to transition into a different occupation. That's the cure, is to change occupations and no longer be exposed to that substance. Drug-induced asthma, you're probably learning about some things in pharmacology that will have a side effect, such as asthma. And some people argue food additives can trigger asthma attacks. Some of this is really controversial. For example, saying monosodium glutamate causes asthma attacks is extraordinarily controversial. There's not a lot of real evidence that MSG is dangerous to people. Um, I actually like Anthony Bourdain's take on it, although it takes some explaining. Uh, a lot of people, when we started to attacking MSG, were really specifically attacking Chinese food, even though a lot of American foods have MSG in them. If you look at your food labels, we can hide MSG under the moniker natural flavors. So go look at your Cheetos and see if you've got natural flavors in there. Um, so when people are attacking MSG, sometimes they're just attacking ethnic food. So Anthony Bourdain somewhat famously said that the real problems caused by MSG, the, the real source of the MSG syndrome is racism, which is probably accurate. Um, again, some things may or may not be causing these things. We don't really know. We can't find a lot of evidence for it. So there's a lot of histological changes seen in asthma. The issue is not just bronchospasm from one asthma attack. The problem is long term our airways are going to see histological changes. Here are those histological changes. Here's a normal bronchial wall. Let me get my pointer going. Normal wall of a bronchus. You're going to have some cartilage in plates. So remember your trachea has cartilaginous rings. And then as you get into smaller and smaller airways, those are rings that become incomplete and they eventually become plates. So you will have a certain amount of cartilage maintaining the structure and patency of that airway. You'll have a certain amount of smooth muscle because we can undergo bronchoconstriction and bond bronchodilation. And of course, that's going to be a big source for our bronchospasm. And we're going to have a certain amount of mucous glands. This should be a ciliated epithelium capable of trapping particles that are making it into that airway and brushing them back up towards the uh, larynx, right, so that you can cough up that phlegm instead of inhaling all of those particles. So with constant irritation of an osmotic reaction, you're going to see hypertrophy. You're going to see hypertrophy and hyperplasia of cartilage. You're going to see hypertrophy of your smooth muscle. You're going to see hypertrophy and hyperplasia of your mucous glands. You're going to have more mucous glands producing more mucus and because these are enlarged as well, now you have a narrowed lumen, a narrowed lumen with more mucus in it. So that's why this is going to be considered an obstructive condition. And here's some pharmacology or some tie into pharmacology. Again, when we have uh, something immunological, when we have something allergic to respond to, mast cells are a big part of that allergic reaction we can target a number of things along this allergy pathway. I'm not going to break down the pharmacology because you've got a pharma class for that. But if you're interested for the tie-in, here it is. Okay, any questions about our different forms of asthma and our histological changes seen in asthma? 
So we'll move on to acute and then, of course, chronic bronchitis. It's exactly what it says on the label. It's inflammation of the bronchi. Uh, it could be viral or non-viral. We could have it from heat or smoke inhalation. We will see inhalation burns in week 10. Burns is week 10. We won't really see it again till then. Inhalation of irritant chemicals or allergic reactions can all cause, all cause bronchitis. And of course, osmotic bronchitis would be associated with asthma. And again, we've got all of our inflammation pathway happening here. If it was infectious inflammatory, right? This is infectious inflammatory. Once again, we're going to see swelling, and that's going to increase the size of the airway. We're going to see mucus production, which is going to at least partially block the airway. What's up? Atherosclerosis for the bronchi. Maybe you could say that in chronic bronchitis, right? Uh, this is acute bronchitis, so you're coughing for a period of a couple of weeks. This is good. There's going to be a little bit of a downward spiral here, though, right? When we're transitioning between acute and bronchitis, with acute bronchitis, you have an infection, you have inflammation. The inflammation is there, as we know, to respond to the infectious agent or irritating particle or whatever it is. Ideally, we'll heal from that. But uh, in some cases, what's going to happen is what we see is changes to the epithelium. We can actually destroy the cilia lining that airway. Now, again, I literally just said it a couple of minutes ago, but why do we need that cilia? Move stuff up. We want stuff to get trapped in the mucus and be moved up by the cilia. Loss of ciliary function means we're going to have some stagnant exudate. How's that going to work out for you? Probably not very well. So that's part of the mechanism where acute bronchitis can transition into chronic bronchitis. Not the only mechanism, but it helps. So loss of ciliary function, por loss of portions of ciliated epithelium, you're destroying that epithelium, that simple cuboidal ciliated epithelium is altered. With chronic bronchitis, 90% of the people you see with chron chronic bronchitis are going to be smokers. So that would be the case where your body's not going to be able to compensate for that loss of ciliary function and the loss of that epithelium. You're damaging it anyway. Yeah, exactly. So they're going to have, they're going to be predisposed from their cigarette smoking to repeated airway infections. There may also be a genetic predisposition for some people. Uh, I got nothing else. We've already looked at our histopathology of asthma, and this is going to be similar in the sense that we're going to have more mucus glands and goblet cells producing mucus. Yes? Yeah. Premature infants? Uh, possibly. And again, why, why do you think that? We'll get to that in a bit, but why do you think? I know that. Yes, absolutely. So we will talk about IRDS, infant respiratory distress, and uh, how that's going to be a product of type 2 alveolar cell failure to develop, often a symptom of premature, or a sign of premature delivery. And um, yeah, absolutely related. Those premature infants will be more prone to a number of respiratory infections. Now, again, that is alveolar, specifically pathology, and this is uh, bronchial pathology. That having been said, I don't want to completely rule out that possibility. I just want to categorize those things for you. Yep. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> no, it was a good observation. Uh, obstruction, again, due to loss of parenchyma. Emphysema. Emphysema is general. Emphysema means collapse of alveoli. And there could be a number of things that cause the collapse of alveoli if you're a smoker of over 70 packs a year, you're going to be prone to emphysema. If you live in a very polluted area, you're going to be prone to emphysema. Certain occupational hazards, and again, we will address our, um, our, our black lung, our silicosis, our anthropo anthroposis, and so on and so forth, asbestos. Uh, that is going to make you prone to emphysema. And then we've actually only seen this phrase once before, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. We saw this actually on our first differential with Marfan syndrome, remember? Possible cause of a collapse of his lung. And in their, their professional differential, they'd put alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. 
So what alpha-1 antitrypsin is, it's an enzyme that acts as a sort of like cleanup crew and maintenance for your lungs. So a genetic deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin is just going to leave your lungs vulnerable at the most simple layer. Your connective tissue is going to be weaker. The parenchyma, the tissue of your lungs, is going to be vulnerable to damage and collapse. So that's the second time you've seen alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I want to bring your attention to what this picture is right here. This picture is scanning electron microscopy image of asbestos. So I want you to imagine that stuff in there and what that's going to do. And we've got some more SEM pictures coming along for some of these other occupational lung hazards. Yeah. If you, it'll aerosolize very easily. So yes, if we broke apart these ceiling tiles, we might get some silica dust or asbestos dust, depending on how old they are. Yeah, some, some good times. Don't inhale dust. I actually have two respirators at home <laughs> because my house was built in 1947 and I do a lot of home improvement and I'm not going to inhale any of these things. I've decided. Yeah. I just got a full face one with protective, yeah. No, for, for, I have some projects coming up, yeah. I'm going to be sanding so down some, some cracked paint, and yeah, don't sand paint. That's a bad plan in general, but I'm going to. So I got myself a full respirator, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Uh, and I recommend everybody does if you have a old, an old house. They're not expensive on Amazon. The one I got for my face was 80 bucks. That was an investment, but it's okay. Um, again... Uh, one thing that can happen with em emphysema, in addition to obviously the causes behind the initial collapse, uh, air can be contrapped in those distal alveoli. That gas exchange is not really going to be functional for you. We can develop something called uh, a bulla in that case. You're going to see that word bulla pretty soon. A uh, bulla, there it is. I found it. <laughs> there it is. So if somebody is experiencing loss of lung parenchyma, that just means loss of lung tissue, functional lung tissue, right? They may have these clinical manifestations. Uh, they may have visual outlines to their rib cage. They may be pursing their lips and sucking. Uh, again, clubbed digits. We already had that for long-term manifestation for low oxygen. Uh, let's see, what else do I wanna say? Yeah, that's all I want to point out about that. You've already had health assessments, so I'm not going to go all in on that. Did you guys cover this in health assessments? Cool. I'm going to point out two words that are very, very similar and two conditions that are very, very similar. Bronchiectasis and bronchiolitis. Frequently confused. So again, focus on what's the difference between these two things. For both of these, we're talking about inflammation of the bronchi, right? I know. That's why I'm pointing it out, because otherwise you get to this later and you're just like, what is this? Uh, bronchiectasis often associated with cystic fibrosis. There's acquired or congenital forms of it, uh, obstructive and pus-forming, superative. Let's compare and contrast that with bronchiolitis, most often in children under the age of two, most commonly associated with respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. This is more likely to be infectious, right? So this one's more likely to be genetic. This one's more likely to be infectious. Not that that's 100% universal, but we're going to roll with it, make our lives easier. Uh, what else do I want to say? And again, if bronchiolitis occurs in adults, probably smoking is involved or immunosuppression. Uh, yeah, since it's more associated with cystic fibrosis, and we already know cystic fibrosis, CF is a genetic disorder. We will address CF on its own. We've already seen CF under our genetic disorders. Yes? I have no idea. No, we can look up, look it up if you'd like. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say? 
I think all of this just sounds like regular old inflammation, so I've got nothing to add to that slide on pathogenesis of bronchiolitis, bronchiectasis, sorry, there you go. And then that's it from bronchiolitis, it's just this one slide. Any questions about those? Just pointing out them out because uh, they're commonly confused. Acute tracheobronchial obstruction is a fancy way of saying there's a foreign body. It means your kid inhaled a button. Which again, your, your textbook doesn't really address the your kid inhaled a button thing, but it's, it's pretty literal, your kid inhaled something, or you inhaled something, maybe a piece of a hot dog, doesn't matter. Um, aspiration of a foreign body, where's it most likely to go in the bronchial tree? Right or left? Right? Which lobe? It's even on the picture. <laughs> we already got right. Which lobe? Which one? <laughs> the third lobe? Is it going to be the superior, middle, or inferior lobe? Inferior. <laughs> there we go. It's just going to go straight down. Why is it most likely to go to the right? Because the heart deflects the left bronchial tree off to the left and it's more horizontally oriented, whereas the right bronchial tree, especially into that inferior lobe, tends to be a straight shot. So that's why we've got this guy uh, doing this little, I can't remember what that's called, I want to say cannula, but I'm probably getting that wrong. And he's lifting that button out, and it's, it's pretty straightforward for it. Uh, let's see. Again, obstruction could also be caused by sudden spasm. We do have smooth muscle around this. Epiglottitis, we can have so much inflammation of the epiglottis that it suddenly uh, obstructs that airway. And you can have compression of the bronchial tree or trachea from a tumor and large lymph nodes. Hopefully those would be slow onset, I'm hoping. Um, and again, another thing your textbook is not addressing is if you had your trachea crushed because somebody crushed your trachea because they were mad. You got choked to death. Um, that would also be bad. <laughs> I don't know why your textbook ignores that physical things happen to people, like getting beat up or like killed, murdered. They just ignore it completely. Um, but yeah, you can crush a person's trachea. That's a thing that can happen. Uh, I mean, think of the cartilage in your fetal pig dissections and. I mean, that was fetal cartilage, so it was a little bit more delicate than the cartilage, but just palpate your own cartilage. Don't try to crush it. Just palpate it. See its flexibility. But you can, you can fracture <laughs> hyaline cartilage, which is what that is. Yeah. Good way to kill a person. Uh, I don't really have a lot to add to. Laryngotracheobronchitis. So inflammation of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. Um, yeah, it's not a lot to add to that. There's our epiglottitis. We have inflammation of the epiglottis. There's a normal epiglottis on the left, and here's an inflamed epiglottis on the right. You can see how that could obstruct an airway. Let's see. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. You guys remember spirometry, right? Hopefully you remember spirometry. Yep. Yeah, so there's incentive spirometry. There's also, in our lab, or not in our lab, but at, you know, Metro Lab, we had some cool spirometers that would put it on a nice graph, and you could see the complete graph, not just watch the thing go up and down. I'm being super unscientific about this. This is not the thing to put on my recording, but I'm moving on. Um, I actually don't care about this chart very much, but you might care about this chart at some point. Um, so all we're saying is forced vital capacity. What's what's vital capacity? It's so inhalation only would just be uh, IRV inhalation reserve volume. If I'm saying that correctly. So what's vital capacity? That would be exhalation. <laughs> Amount of air, of air in and out. So it would be maximum inhalation and maximum exhalation. So the complete volume from maximum inhalation to maximum exhalation, that would be vital capacity. 
Uh, and that's something that we're just going to use as a test for how well the lungs are working, pulmonary function test. And that's all I want to say about it. Okay, that was all obstructive. Now we're going to go to restrictive, which means there's been an alteration to the tissue. Again, we already saw alterations to the tissue that caused obstructions. This is alterations to the tissue that cause restrictions. The pleura, the serous membrane around the lungs, the chest wall. We're going to see some chest wall deformities that decrease our ability to just open our lungs up in a certain dimension. Uh, and neuromuscular function. We will talk about how the brain and the lungs work together. So it could be the lungs themselves or it could be something outside of the lungs, such as, for example, brain. Fibrotic interstitial lung disease is not one disorder. There's a more than 180 disease entities that we would call fibrotic interstitial lung disease. Uh, amongst them, let's see, make sure I'm saying this correctly before I put this on the recording. Yeah, infection of anything infectious of the alveolar walls. So sarcoidosis. We've already talked about this. This is granuloma formation. In this case, sarcoidosis is uh, within the lungs. Remember, sarcoidosis can infect multiple systems. Immunologic basis is the most likely cause. And again, when we say immunologic, we mean either there's an infectious agent or it was autoimmune. We don't always know. And again, we just have epithelioid granulomas in the lungs. When you have a granuloma, you don't have functional lung tissue there. Uh, let's see. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is also known as extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Now we've got inflammation down at the alveolar level to allergens, probably. And this is going to be the one you see more likely in non-smokers. You're likely to see uh, fibrosis in the upper lobes, the superior lobes, in hypersensitive pneumonitis. So when you're normally breathing, what do we call that? If vital capacity is max in, max out, what's our normal respiratory volume called? It's just sitting here, not in fight or flight. Tidal volume, right? During tidal volume, are all of your airways ventilated? Are all of your alveoli ventilated? No. Where are you going to have, where, what part of your lungs, superior, middle, inferior, are you going to have the most air ventilation? Inferior lobes, and you did say it, sorry. Inferior lobes are where most of your ventilation is happening during tidal volume. You active, you utilize your superior lobes um, more often during rigorous exercise. So it's a little bit weird that our fibrosis is in the superior lobes. That's why I'm pointing that out. And also making you utilize our vocab. Promise we were coming to it. Pneumoconiosis, anthracosis, silicosis, asbestosis means we're inhaling something that our lungs can't get rid of. Does anybody remember the name of the immunological cell found down at the level of the alveoli? What's that? Not surfactant, al type 2 alveolar cells secreted surfactant, but the dust cells, good. The alveolar macrophages, yeah, distance high five, that was really good. Um, so dust cells are also known as alveolar macrophages. It's their job to pick up and consume macrophage, big eater, phagocytize, any large particles or any size particles or foreign invaders, viruses, bacteria that make it down to the level of the alveoli. Sometimes we inhale stuff that our macrophages cannot deal with. Asbestos, uh, the particles within uh, coal, anthracosis, silica, and other inorganic dust particles are all things that our dust cells cannot deal with. So kind of like our, our foam cells, right? Those cells are going to try to consume all that asbestos you're inhaling, all that silica you're inhaling, but they're just going to fill with it. So here's some histology. This alveolar histology should look mostly normal until you get to the space within the alveolus. And hopefully you've got your histology down enough to say, 
Uh, those are some abnormal cells located within the alveoli. Those are some macrophages uh, just hanging out within the alveolus that otherwise should not be there, right? They should be within the walls of the alveoli. They shouldn't be out in the alveolar space. They're trying to help, but they can't. They can't break down silica, they can't break down asbestos, so they stay there and they become part of the thing that's blocking the respiratory membrane now. What's the significance of blocking the respiratory membrane? Just think of what, the, what, what comprises the respiratory membrane. What are we supposed to have there in the respiratory membrane? Hmm? Say it loud. The epithelium, so the alveolar epithelium. There's one other epithelium. Do you know? Epithelium of the capillary bed, and they have a shared basement membrane, right? In order to get from the space of air to the space of blood, you're going through these plasma membranes of the alveolar epithelium, the shared basement membrane, and the plasma membrane of the capillary epithelium. That's as small as we can make that respiratory membrane. What's the advantage to have it being small? gas exchange. If we were to thicken the respiratory membrane, now what happens? Less gas exchange. If the rate of diffusion of gases is going to increase, it will take longer and be more difficult. So now we've got a bunch of alveoli hanging out on that respiratory membrane. How's that going to work out for us? It's going to slow it down. Yeah, or stop it entirely. So we are going to disrupt oxygen transport and utilization. We can have some atelectasis as a result of, oh wait, am I, I'm over it, sorry, respiratory distress. Um, never mind, we're back here. Okay, any questions there? And that, that would be similar, by the way, having alveoli, uh, alveolar macrophages trying to consume these. Questions, comments? Okay. Adult respiratory distress syndrome is gonna be similar in etiology to infant respiratory distress syndrome. And you guys already have our type 2 alveolar cells, so I don't have to ask you about that again. You guys rocked that type 2 alveolar cells secrete surfactant. And surfactant, again, you already said it, but what does it do again? Opens the alveoli. It maintains patency of alveoli. It keeps them from collapsing back in on themselves, right? So when we have uh, some event that decreases surfactant production, for example, um, yeah, sorry, lack of surfactant, then yes, we could potentially collapse an alveolus because of that. Atelectasis, fibrosis, uh, alveolar infiltrates would probably make an argument for infectious on that one. And again, it's going to disrupt O2 transport. Uh, hopefully you recognize that this is more normal lung histology where we've got a couple of simple squamous epithelia adhered to each other and go ahead and try to spot some alveoli in that histology specimen. Have fun. Mm -hmm. um, I can't. I don't see any alveoli there. You can see some of the larger airways. You can see some of the damage that goes along with it. With atelectatic disorders, your radiological sign is going to be called whiteout. You want a sort of consistent opacity in your lung x-rays. But when you have the sudden darker, like white, I should say, this white portion right here, that's a sign of atelectasis. And again, as I mentioned, ARDS is going to be simple, similar to IRDS, infant respiratory distress syndrome. Primary cause is lack of surfactant from type 2 alveolar cells. Usually it means that infant did not have time to produce surfactant. It did not have time to produce mature type 2 alveolar cells that participate in the secretion of surfactant. Yes. Yes, as I understand it, it's steroids to increase the rate of lung development. When we say un underdeveloped lungs, this is really the key to a developed lung, is having functional type 2 alveolar cells. The respiratory membrane, remember, that epithelium, that's type 1 alveolar cells. Those are a little bit easier. 
pneumothorax. Pneumothorax on its own means the lung has collapsed entirely. There is spontaneous pneumothorax, which we've already seen in the case of Marfan syndrome. That would indicate most likely an underlying connective tissue disorder if it just happens out of nowhere. But you can also have other things that cause pneumothorax. For example, tension pneumothorax from a traumatic origin. Again, your textbook is skirting around the issue. Somebody got stabbed. Yep. Uh, penetrating or non-penetrating injury could also be iatrogenic. Maybe the knife slipped while we were working on something else. Catamenial pneumothorax. I got a weird story for you on this one. You ready? Okay, endometriosis is a weird disease, right? Uh, endometriosis is a condition in which the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus, is found in ectopic sites. It's found in places where it should not be found. And usually that's going to be really close to the uterus. Mostly it's going to be on the ovaries or on the suspensory ligaments of the uterus, maybe in the nearby intestines, right? And that's bad enough. But for some individuals, endometrial tissue can migrate all the way into the thoracic and pleural cavities. And here's the thing about endometriosis, that tissue continues to menstruate. That's a big part of the source of pain for women with endometriosis is the uh, peritoneal menstruation. When I say catamedial pneumothorax, I mean there's a tissue, there's endometrial tissue in the thoracic cavity and it bleeds once a month and that can pop your lung and then you have pneumothorax. That's what that means. It's weird, right? I agree. Um, so we got some mind blown faces and that's what I was going for there. Yeah. Are we gonna even fit like medication uh, I don't know every treatment for endometriosis. I've heard of a lot of surgical interventions for it. But for catamenial pneumothorax? Um, I mean, we saw with our Marfan's guy, when his lung collapsed, they just gave him oxygen. And again, this is a treatment question and I'm not qualified, so <laughs> it's okay. If anybody has any insight, please let me know. Yeah, so yours was localized to the fallopian tubes. Yeah, so not in your lungs. Yeah. Mm. Super fun spider web of endometrial tissue. Delightful. Uh, another fun fact, this is an endometrial week next week because we'll talk about endometriosis for, for real, but fun fact about it is when we do exploratory surgery on women, about 50% of us uh, biologically female people have ectopic endometrial tissue. It's just some of us are asymptomatic. Many of us are asymptomatic. It's by degrees. So somebody could have very, very minor endometriosis and have severe pain. Somebody could have extreme endometriosis and have no pain. And it's like, who knows? And that's what endometriosis is about. Okay, uh, so spontaneous pneumothorax, you can see the connection between the airways that are supposed to be inside the lungs and the pleural space versus, uh, let's say this guy got stabbed over here. Oh wait, no, this is all spontaneous. Nope, this is tension, there we go. Now, as somebody is experiencing a pneumothorax and that air is coming into the pleural cavity, not the lung space, with every inhalation, it's very easy for air to ventilate into the open lung, but it's very difficult for it to go into the collapsing lung because guess what? it's relying on that pleural cavity sticking to, the, the pleural has to stick to itself in terms of, it just has that little bit of serous fluid. It's relying on that suction to keep your lung open. When that suction is gone, it's almost impossible to fill that lung that's been popped open, that's been burst. So with every inhalation, especially up here in spontaneous pneumothorax, more air is actually going into the pleural cavity. And from here in our tension pneumothorax where we got stabbed, air is coming in through that opening, blood's probably coming in through that opening, but air is not going to fill that lung from ventilation, from breathing. Any questions about pneumothorax? That's collapsed lung from usually air in that space. Plural effusion means we don't just have air in that space. Plural effusion means we can have all kinds of weird things 
uh, inside of the pleural cavity. We can have transudates and exudates. Uh, we could have, uh, again, transudates associated with severe heart failure. That means fluid buildup because, guess what? Left-sided heart failure, fluid in the lungs. It's got to go somewhere. We have osmosis, right? And that can land in the pleural cavity and decrease the volume of the actual lung while filling the pleural space with fluid. Exudates, again, exudate is like an inflammatory thing. It's pus, essentially be from infections, malignancy, sarcoidosis, and then uh, post-myocardial infarction syndrome, which I don't really have anything for you on it. We can have hemothorax, which means there's blood in the pleural space. Chylothorax means there's lymphatic fluid in the pleural space. So these would all be restrictive towards the filling of the lungs, right? These were still on restrictive disorders. Questions, comments before we move on to polio? So now we're kind of in the neuromuscular disorders associated with problems of the lung. Remember, you've got respiratory control groups in your pons and medulla oblongata. What's your major spinal nerve associated with the diaphragm? Hmm? I don't think I heard it. Spinal nerve. We saw it on dissection of our fetal pigs. There's a saying in emergency medicine. Anyone? <laughs> There's a couple of different letters I could use with different connotations. The nerve that innervates the respiratory diaphragm. The emergency medicine saying is that C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. So if you have a fracture to C345, in addition to worrying about paralysis and all the rest of it, you also have to worry about paralysis of the respiratory diaphragm, which would greatly inhibit respiration. But what's that spinal nerve called? Phrenic nerve. Did you Google it? <laughs> or do you just know? Phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve. So there are a lot of neurological ways that we can inhibit respiration by damaging nervous tissue. Poliomyelitis is a viral disease. It's not always necessarily going to impact these specific respiratory regions, but it can. And so that's why we're seeing it under respiratory. So some people with polio ended up with paralyzed legs. Other people with polio ended up with paralysis and respiratory failure because of paralysis of respiratory muscles specifically. That's why some people ended up in an iron lung and some people with polio did not. So of course today we're more worried about the lung, the nerve, nerve serving the lung being paralyzed. Uh, an iron lung was a machine that hopefully we're never going to see again. Uh, that created a pressure gradient that made breathing involuntary. They don't have to do anything. The machine is going to breathe for them. Mm -hmm, I think, yeah, we can check to see if he's still alive. I feel like I check every time to see if he's still alive. Yeah, one of them died. Uh, the, the one guy, I think we did look this up in AMP2 and found that uh, there was one guy who lived a pretty full life, really with uh, his aftermath of polio, spending most of his time in the iron lung. He became a lawyer. He talked about how like they wheel you out in the iron lung and like you're gonna get your verdict <laughs> at that point. Um, so yeah, they, they still exist. We are running out of the machining parts to actually repair those iron lungs. And let's just hope that uh, the anti-vaxxers don't come up against polio because this would be really terrible to bring back into the world. ALS, we'll see it again under neurological. We're seeing it again today because ALS is going to impact uh, motor neurons, ultimately. It's a degenerative disease in the nervous system. And once again, if it degenerates the neurons associated with respiratory musculature, then that person may have profound weakness of respiratory muscles. 
and eventually death as a result of that. Likewise, Guillain-Barre syndrome, we'll see a couple of different times and under a couple of different contexts. It's an immunological basis. It's kind of a weird one. This person probably had a GI infection. It was probably a Campylobacter jejuni. And they had that a little while back. And now suddenly they're experiencing neurological symptoms in what we call an ascending pattern. It started from their feet work their way up through their ankles, lower leg, leg, pelvis, and it's working its way up in terms of things like um, loss of sensation, maybe paralysis, maybe it just starts with drop foot, but it starts to ascend. If it gets to respiratory muscles, the neurons impacting the respiratory muscles, then it's going to impact your ability to ventilate. And at that point, it can be deadly. For most people, uh, they're actually going to have a full recovery. 85% of the people are going to have a full recovery. It's going to be very slow. So this is a really strange and rare um, neurologic complication. Sudden demyelination from distal to proximal. My friend Wei uh, just finished med school, like literally a week ago. And he actually spotted and successfully diagnosed, as much as somebody on clinical rotations can diagnose, a case of Yambare in one of his clinical rotations. So, yeah, nobody else had caught it. And uh, the guy was in. Wei asked him about his history. He mentioned a GI infection. He had neurological symptoms. And Wei took it to his um, clinical advisor, whoever is watching over him, and said, I think this guy has Guillain-Barre. And they called in the pathologist, and they confirmed the diagnosis. And that person took over a year to recover from it. Mm -hmm. We checked in with them to see how he did. So. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have a lot of muscle atrophy, and that'll take a long time to recover from too, for sure. Okay. Myasthenia gravis, again, well, if we've seen it before, we'll see it again. It's an autoimmune condition in which we attack, our bodies attack acetylcholine receptors. Worse with exercise, better with rest. And uh, again, if those acetylcholine receptors happen to be on respiratory muscle cells, then that could absolutely impact respiratory muscles. I think we're just about, let's see how close we are. Yeah, we'll stop at infectious. We'll do chest wall deformities and then we'll stop. Kyphoscoliosis, there's actually kyphosis and scoliosis. We can combine them to call it kyphoscoliosis. Kyphosis is the hunchback. Scoliosis is the lateral deviation. You can have a combination of hunchback and lateral deviation of the spinal column. And the implications here are that uh, this is a very rigid structure, and that person's thoracic cage is not going to be flexible enough to mobilize. There's absolutely a tie in between the structure of the thoracic cage and ability to breathe. When I was a massage therapist, I had a client for about five years with fairly bad scoliosis. And any time I worked, so one side of his rib cage was very compressed and those intercostal muscles were very compacted, right? Those intercostal spaces were very, very small. Whereas on the opposite side, his intercostal spaces were very, very large and overstretched, right? So you're having this muscular feedback happening. Anytime I went to work out his intercostal muscles on the tight side, he would start coughing too. So there's this really, really close connection between these things. Another chest wall deformity is uh, a complication, I should say, of ankylosing spondylitis, which is such a great word. Uh, so again, we consider this autoimmune. And uh, it tends to be long-term and progressive. So you can be fairly young, know that you have ankylosing spondylitis, know that any inflammation event in your spinal column is going to lead to calcification. So you may know well in advance before it takes on this appearance of calcification across intervertebral discs, calcification between joints such as the sternoclavicular joint, and 
calcification at the um, cost over vertebral joint, the connection between the ribs and the uh, spinal column, right? So now you have no mobility. Over time, progressively, there's no mobility of the thoracic cage whatsoever. It's going to be stuck in space. Uh, your spinal column also fuses in space. So there's pain, there's discomfort, there's lack of ability to expand the thoracic cavity. Um, let's see. I do want to remind you guys that um, I just lost my train of thought. Where was I going with that? Nope, no idea. I'll come back to it. And I think we should watch a video of flail chest when we get back from break. So assume we watch the flail chest video to explain how a separated segment of the rib cage, most likely caused by a trauma, is going to have a counterintuitive inward movement on inspiration and outward movement on expiration. <laughs> 